provider. The second way is if you're an out-of-state provider under 670, DESE has a right uh, to ask for certain information from you, and they had a 51-page request for proposal, uh, which was submitted, which uh, Dr. Uh, Neal, who uh, you'll hear from later, took the position that Grandview and MOCAP had to go through this procedure. In relatively short thrift, Judge Wood um, told Desi they were wrong, and, uh, and one of the points of testimony, and hopefully this committee will get a transcript of that proceeding, uh, but Dr. Neal took the position that Grandview, which had been in existence, its MOVA program for seven years under the predecessor to 670, uh, 12, which was uh, Senate uh, 162, 1250, uh, he took the position that Grandview could provide virtual ed to its own students during the sum both during the full school year and the summer, and it could provide educational, online educational opportunities to any student in the state of Missouri during the summer, but and it could provide educational, online educational opportunities to any student in the state of Missouri during the summer, but that Grandview, notwithstanding the plain reading of 670, could not provide online education to uh, students during the fall and spring semesters. Judge Wood immediately asked him, well, what makes that so? And he said, well, it's a different funding mechanism which, as you can tell when you read a copy of the judge's order, he wasn't buying any of Desi's testimony on this point. But what is telling from Dr. Neal, when he talked about differentiating Grandview's MOVA program, he talked about money. And that's what's going on. Missouri sought to expand in 670 virtual education for everyone in the state of Missouri. It did not mean to restrict it. What that meant is that districts would have to take money and pay it towards Grandview's MOVA program. Mind you, not all of the money they get under the foundation formula, frankly, a fraction of it. Once they lost that battle, interestingly enough, the next step is that a district is allowed to do an analysis of whether the particular program with the, which the student wants is in their best interest. It's clear this is meant to be an individualized assessment, and it is not supposed to be one size fit all. What happened is suddenly 20 districts, I don't have the exact count, suddenly followed a template, and I don't know whether that template came from someone at DESE, or whether they all suddenly miraculously came up with this template. But they divided students in the state of Missouri who wanted to participate in MOVA in two broad categories. One where the form approving MOVA had been signed by the district, and then they seg segregated students whose forms were not signed. Another barrier in the way of the student getting access. Imagine being a student in the state of Missouri. You were told by your district that you, and you had a signed form that you could participate in the MOVA program, and suddenly the district gave two explanations. And this is independence, and um, uh, I can, at the moment, I can't remember. I think uh, the other district, uh, I think Blue's, uh, uh, Blue Springs or uh, Warsaw, um, immediately took the position that the person who signed the form either did not understand the form. Let that resonate with you for a minute. The person in the school district signing the form, most of the time who were counselors, did not understand what they were signing. And we can provide uh, copies of these forms. It's a two-page form, and it's clear on its face what it means. Or number two, the person who signed the form did not have authority. For all of those other students who didn't have a signed form, many of the districts have not even done a best interest analysis. They've just decided 
not to give the parents the program that they believed were in their best interest. Without formally denying it, there is no appeal process yet to the um, school board, and then depending on the school board, uh, then it gets appealed to DESE. So a lot of these students are in Never Never Land. They can't appeal the decision. Number two, for those forms that were signed, there is a procedure in 670. If you want to vacate that decision, there is a procedure in 670, and that has not been followed. And I can assure you, nothing in 670 says that if you sign the form inadvertently or the person didn't have authority, that you don't have to jump through the hoops at six, of 670. Finally, Independence is the only school district which has actually decided to issue an opinion on what they believe are why the program is not in the best interest of their students. And interestingly enough, and we have a copy of it, they don't do an individualized assessment at, Ind at Independence. They talk about things like, well, we have school counseling. We have signs of uh, suicide support. We have access through outside partnerships. We have an academic model uh, which is better than uh, anything else that can be offered. We have 90 dual credit courses with potential to receive college credit. If you accept that the individual, that best interest analysis, under independence view, there is never an individualized assessment. What is going on here is crystal clear is that DESE and the school districts do not like what the legislature did in 670. They don't want an expansion of online programming. They want a contraction of online program so that more money stays with the districts. And what ultimately gets sacrificed is those parents who know what is in their child's best interest. I am a parent of four children. And all of my four children, my wife will tell me if I miss one or two, have taken virtual education courses because their school ran out of math courses relatively early on and there were only, there were only options. We had the money, I had to send the kid to WashU. We had the money to send the kid to WashU to take her courses during high school. This is the very thing that virtual education is to, supposed to address. Students who need extra help, parents who believe that there is a program, a full program of courses at MOVA and other places which they think better fit the individual needs of their students. And that's why we have 670. We cannot go backwards. We have to accept that virtual education is here to stay. We have to accept that it is in the parents, parents understand what is in their best interest and that if there is an educational assessment, that educational assessment should be things like, I want my child to take Calc BC, but they've only taken Algebra 1. Or I want them to take a, 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 um, a, 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 a history course that they are not qualified to attend and have an interactive process with the parents. I am here because I have seen over the last 90 to 120 days a systematic approach by DESE and the school districts to place one barrier after another barrier in front of our school, school children to deny them the best educational opportunities available to them. The case that DESE defended before Judge Wood was inexcusable. The statute was clear and they lost hands down. The idea that suddenly now school districts can put more barriers, rip up approval forms with the only explanation that people didn't know what they were reading or didn't have authority was absurd. 
to do an uh, and not an individualized uh, an analysis of what is in the educational best interest of the student in conjunction with the parents in a constructive dialogue, but wave a magic wand and suddenly say, our program is better, you have to stay with us. Darby will testify as to the type of intimidation that the parents have faced in, with school districts how they say, we've got doctorates. We know what is in the best interest of our children. We need to stop putting barriers in front of our children's educational opportunities. We have to hold DESE to task when they take absurd positions. And we have to tell districts that an individual whose parents understand their needs that you need to treat them with respect, with dignity, and take their opinions into account. If we don't stop this, then DESE and the districts will continue to thwart the legislative intent behind 670. And will continue to thwart the court ruling of Judge Woods. And we cannot have a system where the legislative intent is willy-nilly disregarded and a judge's opinion is held for naught because, you know what, we can work our way around it. We know how to get around Judge Wood's opinion. Follow this template. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, what questions do we have for this witness? Uh, Vice Chair Schroer. To inquire. Proceed. Thank you, Counselor, for uh, taking the time to present this testimony before us today. Uh, I kind of wanted to, to pick your brain. I'm not on the uh, education committees, uh, so by the time I get access to these bills, um, they, they have gone through the testimony process. So uh, I kind of want to get your explanation of the differences right now uh, between virtual education and mere course access. Uh, in reading this bill, I see that there is a, a full-time designation for, for virtual education in this bill, correct? That is correct. And that is separate and aside from mere course access, uh, different than somebody saying, all right, I've taken Algebra 2, my school doesn't offer Algebra 3, I just want to take that course, but I'm going to remain in my school district. The virtual education is, is separate and aside from that, correct? That's correct. And the virtual education programs, when you enroll in a full-time program, they have the very things that independents raise. They have full-time counselors. They have access to academic guidance. This is not suddenly where the parent picks and chooses um, you know, five courses and says, that's my academic uh, program I want to take. Well, you kind of it kind of reminds me of uh, my wife. She's a nurse practitioner now. SSM, um, they're offering the the virtual treatments. I guess you could say. Um, so I know even they're they're treating people that do not have insurance for twenty five dollars. You can log on, see the doctor. You have all the same resources just as you were walking into a doctor's office. And I, I remember this bill when it came up. I believe uh, Representative Senator Spencer Senator had, had, it had it in the on Senate. Our side, but I do uh, remember the Senator intent. Senator had it in the Senate. But I do remember the intent behind this as helping those that whether they're in advanced courses, they physically, mentally, health wise, they cannot be in a brick and mortar institution. Um, whether they're problem children, whether it's a, a single mother who, who cannot, doesn't have the resources to uh, send her, her child off to daycare and go to school at the same time. This was getting us up to speed in the education system to the 21st century so that the, the one, size, one size fits all approach that some have argued uh, has been the way of the past in our education system is now a way of the past, so to speak. And now we are up to speed, 21st century, allowing the students in our, in our state to get the education, not that this one-size-fits-all approach says that they should have, but that they actually need. Is that the intent behind Senate Bill 603? Yeah, I think it has a twofold intent. Number one is full-time programming for students and then the individualized uh, classes that you and I talked about. I think what's being lost, first of all, you raise a great point about people having medical issues. One of my uh, clients who I cannot name um, was denied by Warsaw, um, had uh, significant medical issues 
and could not attend a full-time program, and Warsaw turned that person down. I ended up writing a letter to Warsaw explaining the statutory structure and why why they had to approve this. I hate to interrupt, but in that instance, I remember reading um, an article on that. That student who... They, they were initially approved, correct? That's correct. Was there any sort of explanation given uh, that you have access to that you can share here today as to why that decision was reversed? Absolutely not. Uh, Warsaw never explained why the decision was reversed. Well, doesn't um, it state in this bill clearly that when there is a decision uh, to not allow that student, and I, I believe I can get to the page number fairly quickly on this bill, that it must be provided in writing to the student and to the parents why it is believed that it's not in their best interest? Yeah, and, and you're referring, uh, if I'm correct, it's on the third page. It's, yes. Uh, it's 12. It talks about the authorization process shall be continuous, uh, et cetera. It's actually subsection uh, 12 of part uh, three, if I remember correctly. You cannot just sign a piece of paper and revoke that piece of paper. Senate Bill 670 has a specific procedure to do so. Thankfully, Warsaw, upon reading my letter, recognized that their position was absurd. Hopefully, for every district that has a signed piece of paper, they're going to realize that a judge will not appreciate the argument that they didn't understand what they signed Uh, or they didn't have authority because you still have to go through the statutory uh, structure in 670. I think the more important thing that that you raised is there seems to be a view in the world that that this program just benefits uh, those kids who have asked for the online program. And certainly that is the most important thing that we should focus on today. Um, Children are bed-stricken. Uh, children have special needs. Some kids are exceptionally gifted, and they need that type of programming. Um, but the other thing is, let's not forget the ultimate. And you talk about coming into the 21st century. First of all, it's clear that Desi is not ready to come into the 21st century. And if they're going to come into the 21st century, they're going to come kicking and screaming. What, what If you treat children as if it's sort of a bell curve, Teachers spend most of their time teaching uh, to those on both ends of the bell curve. The gifted and the exceptionally gifted require as much time as those students who need remedial help. And who gets lost in the mix? Those in the middle. If you spend the bulk of your time on the, except more time on, not the bulk, but more time on the exceptionally gifted or those kids who are having difficulty, ultimately those in the middle of the bell curve suffer. At the end of the day, if we come into the 21st century, we fully adopt and we fully embrace virtual education. And by the way, Grandview is a school district in our state who has been provided virtual education for seven years. DESE has had no complaints of the thousands of students that they have educated. The idea of this bill is that we trust our school districts in the state of Missouri to come up with an online programming. And that's why they can skip this MOCAP request for proposal. Now, there are two safeguards that are in place after that. The number one we talked about is the program in the best interest of the child. The other thing, and you'll hear from Dr. Neal, under the bill, DESE has ongoing rights to review the programs, and if it finds deficiencies, it can, if it's serious enough, it can revoke the program. Let me stop you right there. You, know, you brought up a great point about reviewing, because I was going to eventually get to that. Um, but on subsection 13 and 14 on page 6 of the, um, the law, I guess it was a bill that we signed into law, 13 goes over the courses approved um, as of August 28, 2018 by the department, um, shall be automatically approved to participate in the Missouri Course Access and virtual schools. And then on 14, we have um, any online course virtual program offered by a school district or charter school, including those offered prior to uh, the aforementioned date, which meets the requirements of Section 162-1250, shall be automatically approved for participation in this program. Was And I do know that this was a, a valid or a very interesting point in the uh, lawsuit that you were part of. Can you explain a little bit more about that and and what it should mean the judge's decision because my biggest concern now is that we'll have districts that are not abiding by the judge's decision which will which will 
eventually maybe be found in contempt uh, of the judge's order, uh, putting taxpayers more on the dime and having resources, which I will be asking Desi where the money is coming uh, in defending these lawsuits, but diverting it from the educational needs of our children in, in defending these decisions and lawsuits. Well, let's start by Desi used the attorney general to defend it, but Fulton School District did not. So the resources that they spend fighting this action were resources that could have gone to computers and other things in the school district. The other thing is under subsection 14, the last sentence, sentence three, it's uh, subsection three, subsection 14 of the bill says a school district or charter school offering such a course or virtual school program shall, and it's mandatory language of the legislature, shall be deemed an approved provider. That sentence was why when I read that sentence, I could stop there, and I knew that I was going to win by uh, with Judge Woods. And is, Woods. It your, is it your belief that since that decision by Judge Wood, um, now certain individual school districts are trying to do the, uh, the 1250 analysis? Yes. Even though they've already been approved by DESE. Yes. So the issue is that the school district providing the online services always certifies themselves as 1250 compliant. Um, so that's number one. And, and DESE maintains, and I repeat again, DESE maintains the ability uh, to review these districts, all of the online programming going forward, and both immediate action and and uh, ask them to do corrective action. For example, they don't have a certified teacher uh, doing the class or something along those lines. Um, but at the end, 1250 has been decided both by the court, number one, but more importantly, the way the statutory scheme is written, the provider, in this case Grandview, does its own 1250 certification like any school district in the state of Missouri or charter school with a brick and mortar school. When someone is transferring to a charter school, we don't ask them to prove everything, you know, for 1250. And so at the end of the day, what they're doing is usurping the plain reading of the statute, which is that Grandview just represents, and the court found this, represents that they're 1250 compliant. Based on the testimony of Judge Neal, uh, uh, Dr. Neal, um, who basically testified unequivocally, we've approved them for seven years, we know there are thousands of students, um, it was clear that Desi themselves had found they complied with 1250. But I don't think Desi is going to sit here today and tell you that it is not up to the district providing online, uh, online uh, programming. They're the ones that simply certify, or not even certify, but you know, say I'm 1250 uh, compliant. I think what's going on here is now what the districts have done is, with an unequivocal order of Judge Woods, what they're doing is fine, we can do our own 1250. We can make you jump through the hoops of a 1250 analysis. But that's not required under this bill, and it, it shouldn't be the, the process that the districts are abiding by pursuant to this bill, correct? I will be shocked if DESE tells you that a best interest analysis requires a district to do, meaning the district, the sending district, to do a 1250 analysis. It is plain on the reading of the statute is in best interest, and I'll be e equally shocked if DESE takes the position today that it is not an individualized assessment um, and that you can do what independents did, namely just say, well, we're better, uh, so we're not going to take you. Remind you, independents, Missouri as a state, I want to remind everybody, we're on, I, by most people's gauge, the bottom third right. of all states as far as educational quality. So it's an F to begin with. Well, and for a minute, take, take your attorney hat off. Yeah. It, it's hard to do. I'm an attorney as well. Um, and, and put your, your parent hat on. You've got four children. I've got two, um, not yet in kindergarten yet. Do you believe, uh, as a parent and a Missourian, do you believe that bureaucrats – should be determining what is best in the best interest of your children. Probably n neither one, you know, of the four, none of them are the same. Uh, it, do you believe that that should be the, the determining factor is what bureaucrats believe are in the best interest of your children or the parents and the physicians of said child? 
Oh, look, if some school district told me how to educate my child, I would lose my mind. I am the best person, and my wife, probably my wife is better than <laughs> I am, I've got to be frank about it. My wife and I, as a team, um, work to, we, first of all, we're with our kids on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, where most of the teachers get at best an hour a day with those students, and the counselors, uh, the, my whole tenure in public school, I'll be shocked if the counselors spend more than an hour with my kids, and only the principals only had a passing familiarity with my children. The only people who should maybe be making uh, this decision are the parents to decide what is in the best interest. A, I wouldn't trust bureaucrats to make that decision. I will, however, go a step further. Bureaucrats who have established a public school system, which is in the bottom third of any state in the United States, and by the way, the United States isn't doing a particularly job nationwide, those bureaucrats, I really, I question whether they know what they're doing. So at the end of the day, the question, the simple answer is, Parents, the purpose of Senate Bill 670 was to allow parents to decide what is in their best educational needs of their students, and that the school certainly can enter into an interactive process with the parents to discuss why did you pick the school, why did you think it was good, and everything else. But at the end of the day, the parent's decision should control whether a child participates um, in online education. And this is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. This is an issue that every parent who has children understands that you're with them on a day-to-day -day basis. You see what homework they're having difficulty with. They come back and discuss their peer groups in their classes. They complain when the class is going too slow. They complain when the class is going too strictly. No one in this room would criticize a parent for making the decision to remove their child from one school and either picking a private school or relocating or picking up and moving to another better school district. My wife and I, frankly, did the same thing. We lived in the city of St. Louis. We wanted a better school district, so we moved from the city of St. Louis to the school district. No one would criticize us. No one would question us. No one would raise their doctorates in education and say, I have a master's in education. I know better than you relative to the kids. What is going on today in the state of Missouri is parents want to do the exact same thing. They're not happy with the school district they're in, and they, for various reasons, whether it's the health of the kid, whether it's the peer group within the kids, whether you know there's violence in the school, whatever the case may be, we live in a society where some kids are afraid to walk the halls in their school district, um, and the parents have made a decision not to move to a charter school, not to move to a brick and mortar public school, but to move to a virtual school. The fact that in the 21st century, we are treating the MOVA program different than the Grandview brick and mortar school shows a misunderstanding of where education is today and the purpose of the legislature in passing 670. Well, Counselor, put your um, your barrister's hat back on. I want to dig deep into some of these lawsuits uh, without getting too specific. Through a number of these lawsuits, uh, in the discovery process, obtaining information, uh, number one, was there any discovery process that, that occurred through interrogatories, requests for production? Uh, no, we got some Sunshine Act requests, but given the need to get the children into the program quickly, uh, we did it by way of a writ of mandamus, okay. um, which for the lawyers in the room uh, know and for the non-lawyers is an extraordinary remedy rarely granted by the court. So the fact that we won really tells you a lot about what the judge felt about Desi's position. Now, since, since that time, uh, have you gained access to any sort of framework 
uh, or analysis rather for that the school districts or DESE has implemented for determining best interest. This best interest analysis, is there any guidance that you've seen um, which either DESE or the school districts are using to determine this? Well, you know, I'm wondering where everybody got this template from. The only thing we found is there's a bunch of lawyers, and you'll forgive me, I think it's Education Plus, so I can't remember the name, if you want it, that basically gives a playlist of how to screw students. Make them now go, th and you'll forgive me for using uh, that word, but they created on their website, now make the parents go through a 1250 analysis. I do not know whether DESE is educating school districts on the playbook or not. I certainly hope that I'm wrong, um, but it's, the playbook is seemingly the same for all districts, and it seems to be evolving. Play dumb on forms provided. If you provided a form, play dumb where they didn't have authority. Deny without denying, so there's not an appeal to the school board and ultimately a, an appeal to DESE. Or finally, the newest playbook, do a best interest analysis, but do it so broadly that no child in independence would ever be allowed to participate in the MOVA program. What is really going on is DESE and the school districts want to limit the amount of online programs in the state of Missouri. I think there are eight that DESE put through the request for proposal, you can ask them the exact amount. If you limit the amount of programs available to kids, you're not going to get the best providers. And if you don't have the best providers, what are the parents gonna do? They're gonna stay where they are and their money is going to stay with them. So I can tell you as far as the MOCAP program, I have no doubt that DESE is trying to limit the providers so that we don't have the quality of online programs we should have. It, as far as the, the first barrier was placed by DESE, 100% with the Fulton case, they wanted to delay and they got their 60 day delay with the idea that if you put a barrier in front of parents, eventually parents are gonna wave the white flag and give up. How many parents, because MOVA was not on the MOCAP provider list during that 60-day period, said, you know, I'm going to stay where I am, even though it doesn't provide the educational opportunities? Well, I, I know I've dug up a little bit of this information, but you probably have more up-to-date numbers. I think as of last week, 200-something have already been approved for the virtual program, and I think 600-something were still in limbo for various reasons. Are those numbers correct, and do you have any, any guidance on why that 600-plus students and their parents and their families uh, are still hanging in limbo? I can't speak to how many have been approved. I, I've been told the numbers over 500 parents are being denied educational opportunities by various school districts throughout the process. I have no information on the next barrier. Whether the, I know the first barrier was put up by DESE, and it was inexcusable. You've read that line that says they're automatically approved. The next barriers, those are being put up by the individual districts. I hope that DESE has had no hand in creating this playbook. Do you know if DESE's providing any, and we can ask them as well, but do you know if they're providing any guidance as to how the districts individually can comply with the law? Well, they should be. They should be telling the districts We've got 500 kids who are, uh, you know, who are being denied educational opportunities. And Dr. Neal, like, seemingly is sitting on his hands. I don't know if they're going to try um, to do some other form of action. But what I do know is DESE is allowing this to go on. It is allowing the district to thwart the educational opportunity of students. That there should be a dialogue meetings to resolve this issue. What is fair game to, I, I frankly feel that the assessment should be relatively simple. Why did the parents um, choose this program? Uh, what, you know, what, wh why? What was the benefit and why do they believe that this program fits their children? In my view, the analysis ends there. 
okay? It really does. It's an individualized assessment. I will be, what I do know is that what Independence is doing with the broad strokes, I'll be shocked if Desi would find that acceptable. They know it's an individualized assessment. And they know with a letter like Independence issued that no child will ever be approved for the MOVA program. So I think that Desi knows the Independence letter is out there and they should do something about it. Well, I know you, you indicated what uh, I want to do with this committee hearing and that is resolve this issue uh, so that every student, no matter their zip code, no matter their uh, educational status, their, their learning ability, gets the education that they need. Uh, but I'm going to... I'm going to finalize my questioning to you and turn this over to the rest of the committee members. Anybody else have any questions? Councillor Veet. Uh, but as far as oversight, the virtual programs that are set up by the school district, they have the same oversight. The school district has the same oversight as, of that as they do the classes taught in their classroom, do they not? Yeah, yeah, the school district set it up, yeah, and yeah. So they are being supervised and, and, and monitored. And verifying that they comply with 1250. And so that's all being done already, so there's no need to have a separate program. You mean by separate program, you oh, mean? Oh, Desi doing their own separate. It's what Desi wants to do is be the gatekeeper, right? They don't trust their own. own school districts in the state of Missouri, Grandview, which has been running a program. Let's not forget it. It doesn't, Grandview is the most simple one. It's been in existence for seven years. It's taught summer school to literally thousands of students. But let's say, let's use Ledoux as an example. If Ledoux wakes up tomorrow and says, you know what, we want to create an uh, online program. Ledoux will make the decision, set up the program, confirm that it complies with 1250, and under 670, we trust Ledoux to make sure that ed educational product complies with 1250. They could do that tomorrow. DESE hasn't lost oversight, by the way. Remember, 670 gives them permission if they see a problem with 1250 <laughs> compliance, they can go to Ledoux tomorrow and say, we have an issue with 1250 compliance. This whole thing is absurd. We trust our school districts, brick and mortar schools and charter schools, by the way, to educate their children. So we don't trust them to educate children from another district. Some districts accept tuition. So now is there a new mechanism if a child from Blue Springs, it's a long trip, so you know, let's pick what, Warsaw, for example. If a child from Warsaw wants to attend Ledoux, I think they still uh, take tuition, I'm not sure. I think Clayton does, so yet let's use Clayton. If a children from Warsaw wants to pay tuition and go to Le, uh, Clayton, no one asks Clayton, are they 1250 compliant? All the, but the problem is that Desi and the school districts are living in a world that it existed before the 21st century. That somehow, because it's out there in the ether, we don't understand it, so therefore we won't even trust our own brick and mortar and charter schools. So what Dr. Neal said to the judge was, whether you're a school district or a charter school in the state of Missouri, you are not approved for MOCAP without going through a 51-page request for proposal. You read the one line. I don't know what Dr. Neal was thinking or Desi was thinking with this litigation. He's here. You can ask him. But the bottom line is that the goal is to get if someone in the state of Missouri with a brick-and-mortar school or charter school wants to enter into this virtual school programming, they can enter in without any barriers at all. That's clear from 670. The other thing that I think everybody needs to know, and you can ask Desi if this is still true, there is no full-time, I think when, when Dr. Neal testified before Judge Woods, there was one class one class that was approved 
to provide K-1 through 5 education. One class, not a whole program. So given what's going on, first, there are no full-time programming students for kids way K-1 through 5, at least as the day of the trial. So if I have a child for K-1 through 5 that does not think that their school district is providing an ed educational opportunity, the best educational opportunity, they've got nowhere to go. The other thing is, let's forget K-1 through 5. A parent with an eighth grader who wants to go to MOVA, has looked at the Grandview program and wants to go to MOVA, should be allowed to go to MOVA after a meeting with the school district generally explaining why the child you know, fits with MOVA. That child is being denied an educational opportunity. And every day that a child lacks an adequate education, that child can never get it back. And each of us in this room know that every day in a good school program builds on the next day and the next day and the next day. The fact that a fraction of the students who want to take online education in the state of Missouri have been approved, if your numbers are correct, 200, let's use, you know, 500. A majority of school districts in the state of Missouri who want an online education in a program like MOVA, or in this case MOVA, are not getting what they want. And that demands action. And how DESE is not in the forefront of solving this problem convinces me that they don't want a quality virtual online educational uh, product other than those that they vet and approve, regardless of which 670 says. So a 670 provides that the school district can set up their own program. Correct. If we suddenly make that, that you can set up your program, but then you have to be uh, comply with all of DESE's separate rules unrelated to this, the school district basically lost its ability to set one up because they ultimately can, Desi would ultimately control, wouldn't it? It's exactly. All they're doing is backdooring. This is a back, what is going on today is a backdoor around the judge's ruling. The school districts are saying, you prove to us you're 1250 compliant. And that is not what is required. You do not have to, the, because it is the school districts themselves, all they have to do is tell the world, we are 1250 compliant. No one else can make them jump through the hoop. And that's the way the system works. All the school districts, Kansas City, everything else, they do their own 1250 analysis. And they, you know, by having certified teachers and teaching the programs, that's all that's ever required of them. Because it is virtual and untouchable, and because we live in a day where some of us are getting older before virtual education existed, we're having trouble grappling with the fact that the educational system is changing. The legislature was far ahead of DESE when it came uh, to this, because they wanted all of the school districts in the state of Missouri, whom they trust, to provide an educational opportunity and whom they trust to educate their own children, they wanted to give them a jump start so that they could get in the marketplace, get there, get a product. And over time, as virtual education improves and more programs get in there, the quality of the education will naturally improve over time. And what's gonna happen five, 10, 15 years from now? We're gonna have a greater percentage of students saying, it's in the best interest of my kids to do online education. I just want to thank you for your input. Any further questions? Representative Meredith, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so a couple questions. First of all, this you've gone through court on this, and the judge found in your favor. Is there any indication that uh, Desi's appealing that? I have not heard not. They can tell you the 30 days has run normally. A I haven't done the timetable, but it's normally 10 plus 30 for the judgment to be final and 30 days to appeal. I looked the other day well over the 30 days, but we haven't hit the 40 day threshold. I actually called the attorney general 
and uh, the assistant attorney general who handled this case, and he said this was a couple of weeks ago. He didn't know whether Desi was okay. appealing. It would be a frivolous appeal. Well, I, I guess what I'm asking, are, are you now going into the process uh, as far uh, as being an approved vendor, essentially? Yeah, Mo so Desi did immediately comply with the court order. The court gave Desi a deadline by which it had to be, Mo uh, MOVA had to be listed as an approved provider. Okay. Desi complied with the court order timely, and I applaud Desi for that. Um, so as of today, MOVA is an approved MOCAT provider. But I guess I'm curious why we're here. You're here because the school districts, the next step under 670 is the school districts are, have to make a finding that the program that the parents pick is not, it's in the negative, not in the best educational interest of the children. Okay. So what school districts are doing is they're taking the 1250, uh, they're all doing it slightly differently, but what they're doing is... If you didn't go through the 1250 process, it's not in the best interest of the kids. Or prove to us 1250. Sure. And, and that's, that's not how it's done. So I want to I back up. So the, the new law did allow, it, it, it says explicitly that DESE remains the ability to review course materials and all of that. Are you suggesting they can review it, but they can't actually do anything about it if N they don't like it? No, 100% they can. The program, so the way it works, it's a, it's a, if I can explain it, the first step is uh, school districts in the state of Missouri, charter schools and individual schools who have brick and mortar, immediately get approved as a MOCAP provider. Everyone from out state has to submit a request for proposal to DESE. Okay, so you have two categories, but at the end they both end up as a MOCAP on this MOCAP provider approved list. The next step is a parent goes to the school district and says uh, to the school district or the charter school, I want my child to participate in the MOCAP program. What is supposed to happen is it's all, it's supposed to be perfunctory, uh, but the statute says that if the district finds that it is not in the best interest of the child, then they can deny that request. And so certain school districts are saying, we will not do a best interest analysis without you proving 1250 compliance to us. So what does 1250 compliance include? It's a category of verse seven or eight. I have a copy of the statute. It's seven or eight uh, things. Uh, you'll find it on. Um, is one of them like a, a data check, a data security check? One of them is a data security check. Okay. Uh, so have you gone through a data security check? So has, the has Desi been able to check and make sure that the data that you get of our kids is going to be secure? Well, so let me explain that to you. The way the process is designed is that the school district, Grandview, certifies that basically says we're 1250 compliant, which includes that data check. They have to say we are 1250 compliant. And so you're saying that, that DESE doesn't get to, de to confirm that for the sake of all the other school districts that didn't do that check? Every school district in the state of Missouri, DESE doesn't individually go to those school districts and determine whether the 1250 sure. compliant. It has been the history, let me, it has been the history of Missouri schools that they simply verify that they are 1250 compliant. Do you think that there is a heightened risk of data security issues for an online vendor? I, I, I'm not an expert, but the short answer if, is- If you're taking classes online, do you think there's an additional risk of your data being secure I'm sure there's an additional risk. Okay. I, 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 mean, I, I mean, I think that's implicit. Uh, I do, too. I think okay. that was the point. So the fact that you didn't answer that right away makes me question. Well, because to be honest with you, I'm not an expert in all things uh, cyber. Well, but I, I guess what I'm getting at, let me, let me, let me make it. I know exactly here. where you're well, getting at. Let me make it. Uh, so if we've got a heightened concern of online courses, making sure that they are vetted properly so that our kids' data is not accidentally breached, and made public. I know that's something that this legislature has spent a lot of time expressing concern over. These are courses that are being paid for by state taxpayer dollars, right? You're, you're talking about getting state taxpayer dollars to pay for this private online company uh, to track kids' data in their school. Like their entire schooling will be online. So is now, Grandview, by the way. So Grandview has decided that, that, that they are sufficiently secure, right? Correct. But other schools are saying, we're not sure we want to rely on 
Grandview's analysis of that, we would rather rely on DESE vetting that with the RFP process that they have for 1250, including things like reviewing your, your data security. Is that accurate? Uh, well, actually, it's not accurate. So if you'll let me explain it to you. All data for school, the reason why I hesitated with your question is that all school district data, even those in brick and mortar schools, we don't keep them locked in file cabinets. All of this data is out there. Uh, identification. Right, but the school district has control of their own can I data, correct? No, sometimes they use outside vendors. Sure, that they help. choose. Yes. So Right. This would be a vendor that they didn't choose that a different school district vetted instead, correct? Well, and this is what you're missing because it's clear to me that you have not, it's not that you, you've read 6, 670, but I think the, the factor that matters is that the way 670 was set up is that we trust our own school districts. This is a grand view program. This is not Joe Schmo sitting in New York. This is a Grandview run program. We trust Grandview in two respects. We trust them, number one, with the data for their students to make sure it's secure, which I am not, I, I will disagree with you if you're trying to maintain that the data which Grandview keeps uh, on the web or in the cloud is no less vulnerable to attack than the online programming. That's where I would Sadly, disagree. there's more data. B if no, the whole class you're taking is online, everything you're doing is online and accessible that way. Whereas when you're in a physical classroom, your, your, your actual daily coursework isn't being monitored online and accessible online if someone were to hack in, correct? So your, concern is, not in the right? your concern is not in the individualized data, but the date someone hacking the individual day-to-day -day work of a student, is that what you're concerned? Sure, possibly. Okay, so then this is 670 is set up exactly to address your concern. The legislature has decided that a brick that they trust a brick and mortar school to make sure that the data is protected and not subject to vulnerable attack. Right. Wait, let me well, continue. No, no, no. no. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. going to jump in here. Right, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> but we also said in 670 that each individual school district has the ability to determine whether or not it is in the best interest of their students to use a particular online vendor. And if that individual school district is saying, I'm going to not trust a different school district. I mean, I'm in St. Louis City Public Schools. Do I want our kids uh, ha going into a program that has been vetted by a completely different school district and that has no oversight by any entity that my taxpayer dollars go to pay for? I would prefer and trust my school district to make the choice that it's in the best interest of my students uh, to rely on DESE's gauge of whether or not this is in the best interest of the kid. And so, that might be deferring to the 1250 process. And so let me explain to you that, A, I disagree. The city school district, if you've read the statute further, there's, it's in the negative, by the way. It's not in the best interest of the children with an explanation. The only school district, not one school district, has ever said, I do not think it is in the best interest of the child because you haven't provided web security. The NOG won. The only school district to provide a reason was independent, but let's come to oh, the oh, city. I, I'm saying even if they're, they're less specific and say, I don't trust you because you didn't go through the process everyone else went through. I mean, let, let's be clear here. You're, you're suggesting, I've heard you say multiple times that, the, that Desi's just trying to limit choices and keep people out of the process, but there are plenty of other vendors that just went through Desi's vetting, and you chose not to, correct? Because 670, let's start from the beginning. 670 trust the legislature in, in doing 670. Could you, trusted, have, when, could you have gone through the RFP process? We certainly could go through the RFP process. The Why don't you want to? It has nothing to do with not wanting to do it. It has to do with a statutory compliance with 670. And if you had read further in the statute, since you're in the city, when a kid goes to a charter school in the city, 
Do you make them jump through the whole 1250 compliance? The statute not only said not in the best interest of the children, but you should address those same protocols which you address in charter schools. So I turn the question back on you, since you're in the city of St. Louis, are you putting your charter schools through the same vetting process? The no, I think our vetting process for charter schools is insufficient. But I do think that, that this particular statute is different than charter schools. But it is a different process. We're talking about online education, which has different uh, problems and uh, and advantages. So it has to be treated a little differently than charter schools. I think making that comparison is is a little bit ridiculous. Well, uh, uh, but I, you know, it may, I'm it good with this conversation. I think my my remaining question should be for Desi. Well, let me let me finish for a minute because the statute is very specific that the process shall be for the charter schools. So the way you are analyzing it, you are rewriting the statute, which clearly says that the best interest analysis shall be made based on the same process used for charter schools. So that's number one. You are skipping that whole part of the statute. The other thing that you are forgetting, which I think is critical, is the way the legislature set up this process. If DESE has concerns about web security, 670 allows DESE to come in and express those concerns to MOVA and give MOVA time to fix it. By the way, if DESE thinks it's an emergency, that there is a significant risk to student data, DESE can take immediate action. So while I appreciate your concerns, in order for you to make it through all of your hoops, the first thing is you have to hold MOVA on the best interest analysis to the same standards as a charter school. Number two, you're forgetting that DESE maintains control over the process from this day forward. And if they, DESE believes that they have issues with web security, DESE can intervene immediately. So to answer your question, I do not, the one thing I know that a a best interest analysis, I can tell you what it's not. A best interest analysis is not circumventing Judge Wood's ruling and making a school district do a whole 1250 analysis. All right, Mr. Schindler, I'm going to interject here. Um, we have a quick time limit. I think we have to be done by 2.30. Um, so I'm going to turn this over and have Desi, since we mentioned them a lot. Um, Dr. Neal, Desi, and all those... Uh, I believe the uh, attorney for Desi is here as well. So anyone that would like to speak on this, please come forward. Um, try to limit the uh, introductory testimony to five to ten minutes, and then we'll open it up to the panel. Please proceed. Thanks. I'm, I'm Mike Harris. I'm the legislative liaison for Desi. Um, appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you guys. Uh, this is Dr. Chris Neal. You've heard his name a lot. Um, I will let him give a short little introduction and then um, just let you guys ask us what questions you may have. Thank you so much for a chance to come visit a little bit about virtual education, the MOCAP program particularly. When uh, Senate Bill, uh, I'm sorry, when the MOCAP statute went into law about a year ago, 161-670, both the department and public school districts were given a new set of responsibilities and those are inside the realm of virtual education. Not all virtual education is mocap, but certainly uh, mocap is a very critical piece and that's the part of the law that we refer to as 670. In terms of the department's responsibilities as required by the statute, we are to create an authorization process, we are to monitor, and then we are to report to you. Districts have some responsibilities as well and I'll go through those very quickly in a minute. When the statute indicated that the department was to create an authorization process, there were several things that had to be examined. First, at the vendor, vendor level, could they keep data secure? And two, were they willing to accept monthly payments? And then at the course level, were the course courses or full-time program aligned to the Missouri Learning Standards? Were they taught by Missouri teachers? Were they priced in accordance with the directives of the law? Uh, were they accessible for students with disabilities? And so in the course of trying to ensure both security of student information and quality coursework for our students, the RFP was born. 
we understand that Judge Wood found that uh, the subsection 14 uh, <coughs> gets courses offered by or full-time programs offered by districts into the program and that we retain uh, the obligation to monitor uh, those programs. I'd like to speak just a minute about that uh, after a while. But we are to monitor both how students are doing in, that, in those courses. We are to monitor course performance so that we find out whether courses are performing well for students. Finally, we are to report to you, uh, at least to the uh, chair and ranking members of the House and Senate Education Committees and the governors about the uh, effectiveness of this program, particularly uh, number of courses, prices, enrollment figures, things like that. In terms of districts, uh, districts are to adopt a policy that treats virtual enrollment, uh, MOCAP enrollment requests the same they way they would any other course. <laughs> They're to publish uh, the program availability to parents on their website, in their parent handbooks, in their enrollment materials. They are to treat a request for enrollment uh, with a presumption that the student would enroll if they're eligible unless the student, this is not in the best interest of the student, and if they deny it is to be in writing, they are to uh, provide for an appeal that would ultimately come to us. They are to monitor student success once the students enroll and provide us feedback so that we have better information on the performance of those courses. It's important just a minute uh, for clarity of thinking to understand the difference between 670 and the law we referred to as 1250. 1250 is really a funding law. It begins with a recitation that if a district wishes to claim state aid or virtual coursework, the coursework must satisfy a set of requirements. I believe it's 12 requirements and 12 sub-requirements that are called out that seem to be largely technical in nature, but also that they're taught by Missouri teachers and aligned to Missouri learning standards. So that's what 1250 is about. 670 says, here's a whole new program for delivering coursework across the state, state to our students. And so with that uh, general outline of how we understand those two uh, pieces of legislation, or two pieces of statute, uh, there are two or three things I'd like to say, uh, probably just to clarify uh, in response to Mr. Schindler's statements. First of all, we have no interest in limiting providers or content. Our interest is in protecting student information and in ensuring quality. Second, we've had no involvement in providing uh, any school district a template about some kind of uh, 1250 evaluation or denial process. Because the appeal comes to us, uh, we want to remain relatively neutral in that. And now if you will let me wrap this up, our current conditions of the MOCAP program. We do have 10 vendors now. Uh, immediately after Judge Wood's order, we requested information from Grandview around MOBA. We have mounted everything that we've received on the web. And from this point forward, our interest is ensuring that we receive information to enable the reporting to you. Uh, we also received uh, another school district's offering into the catalog very much the same way. So we applied Judge Wood's principle uh, to another school district that requested. Uh, because uh, of this addition, we now do have offerings for grades K through 12 in those 10 vendors. As of this morning, we have 590 courses that meet all the standards either approved by the district or through the RFP process. Those 590 courses are not all that's there. We're aware from our vendors that there are about uh, 725 that they are preparing to put through. And finally, we have our uh, request for proposal open so that we can have additional vendors and additional coursework submitted. With that, I would be very happy to answer any questions I could. Well, thank you both for coming today uh, and, and being part of this process. I've seen through the different documents that I have uh, that you've worked with uh, several people here today, including the Senate sponsor and others, to try to, to get this thing implemented in such a way that the students um, re requesting this type of education get it uh, as need be. However, uh, like with many things in the legislature, there are hurdles. 
Uh, so I kind of want to start with um, the rules and regulations. As Jay is chairman of JCAR, and I know we have some members of that committee here as well, uh, I, I've seen that there were some rules uh, on course access, but I did not see anything uh, on the virtual education. Is any of you all aware of any rules uh, that are needed, uh, or have any rules been promulgated that, that we just didn't see? Uh, because I, I kind of want to know what, in in regard to the the lawsuit which we're, we're discussing here today um what you all were relying upon in making that determination so kind of a two-part question for you okay so uh, the author 670 contains uh statements that we should promulgate rules to enable this process and so on and so forth primarily around the authorization process so i think that's the first answer to your question uh, I do believe that I saw some for the course access, but I the the full time virtual I did not see any, um, and I can go back to the uh, the secretary or general counsel for JCAR to see, but I didn't see any that that were promulgated. And I could be wrong. I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, please. I don't think we had any intention in wording that rule of excluding a full time program, but we may need to revise that rule. Certainly following. Uh, Judge Wood's decision, we have to reconsider whether or not the RFP, as stated in that rule, is still applicable. So in, let's, let's backtrack to the lawsuit. Um, kind of, you know, bluntly put, why, and whose decision was it to defend um, that denial back then? Because it's my understanding that this program, the Grandview one, was in existence for seven years. Uh, I, I am not aware of any issues that were, that anybody knew of uh, in regard to that program is being subpar for uh, virtual education and course access. Um, so whose decision, number one, was it to, to defend that lawsuit? Um, <laughs> let's just start there. Whose decision was it to defend the lawsuit? Uh, wow. If you can just introduce yourself. I'm Peggy. <laughs> I'm the chief counsel at DESE, and uh, part of the rationale was... We did not catch your name. We heard oh, that. I'm sorry. It's Peggy Landwehr. Thank you. And um, part of the rationale was that it was not the proper vehicle because it was a writ of mandamus, but Grandview had never applied to be part of our program, and so there was no denial of that of an application. And so we had not refused to do something we were asked as a state agency. So do you know? Do you know where that? I, you know, I heard that the attorney general was used to defend this lawsuit. Yes. Um, but kind of looking forward um, to ensure that money's not being diverted for our students and our education system. Do you know if the school districts are sued? Let's say um, they're not abiding by the judge's ruling. Do you know where that? money is going to come from to defend those school districts in particular i'm assuming it comes out of local out of the local funding correct the uh, department and most state agencies are defended by the attorney general's office so are you aware of any uh any, any issues that were brought up today as far as the the districts being a, a blockade so to speak in terms of these students because we've heard that um, one student was uh, approved and then they were denied um we've got bunch of students in limbo and I think we can all sit here and agree that ultimately we want the best education for these students uh, there is some argument in in the newspapers and the articles that um, some believe that Desi is going to uh, rule in favor of what bureaucrats and the, the superintendents believe is in the best interest uh, then there's others that believe that parents such as myself mm. believe that parents and the physicians of those students psych you know psychiatrists uh, believe is in the best interest so uh, is, De is Desi putting forth any um, framework to ensure that these, let's say, rogue districts are uh, being dealt with to ensure that they are complying with this law? Um, I would agree with what Dr. Neal had said, that we're going to be part of the appeal process. And so those appeals would come to us. But being proactive and ensuring that these students are receiving the education in a timely fashion uh, we've, we're already hearing complaints from, I'll say, rogue districts, um, districts that are trying to go around this law. Uh, is it not Desi's responsibility to ensure that these districts are complying with, with this law? Uh, 
first of all, Chairman, we heard things for the first time today, so we were not aware of what was being testified to earlier. The second thing is we have had some initial discussions in the, at the outset in order to remain neutral. We were uh, reluctant to itch, issue too much guidance as the receiving uh, officers of the appeal, but we've had some initial discussions that that may be necessary. We haven't done anything yet. Well, let me fast forward um, to, to an issue that really uh, I need answered, and I think some other members too. Let's focus on the best interest analysis. Um, you know, I am of the mindset that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach for uh, educating students in Missouri. So do we have a framework in place? Is there a document that you can provide to us uh, laying out the framework uh, of this analysis? What is and what is not in the best interest of each individual student? I, w I would say that that is all up to the local district. That is not for DESE to decide. And I think each local district has that process in place. <laughs> Does that make sense? Is, is it, can I see this anywhere? Because uh, I would like to see. Um, I, the, the requirements of the law are that each district have a policy. All of their policies should be out on their, okay. their website. But, now, that's a, but those are district-specific policies around the process around enrollment, not coming from DESE. And what what that means. So in a situation where there is a district that has a rule in place, a framework in place that clearly is not in the best interest of the students, uh, it might be financially in the best interest of the district. Um, is it DESE's, and this is just my ignorance coming into play with the whole hierarchy, so to speak, is it DESE's position to come in and, and try to correct that, to ensure that not only are students getting the education that they need in that district, uh, but that we are not setting ourselves up for lawsuits down the line. Go ahead. That section of the law that talks about the student's right of appeal goes to the local board of education, and then if uh, the local board of education denies, it comes to the department. Given the broad stroke that you gave there, it would not appear to me, if that's all I heard in the case, that the district said financially this isn't what we want to do that's not uh, a student-centered decision so I is it true and i don't you may have this information or not is it true that the i guess it's the warsaw case uh that uh, counselor Sindler was referring to where the student was denied and no explanation was given is that is that the case i don't know anything about that this that's part of what we heard for the first time today okay and, and let's say it is true um does Dusty have a responsibility to to come in and ensure that these districts are complying strictly with this law as plainly interpreted. Like, let's say if that district did not give any guidance, refused uh, to, to put the student within the virtual education process, obviously they are, under the plain reading of this law, they're not abiding by the law, they're breaking the law. Um, is, it, is it or is it not Dusty's responsibility to, to have discussion with that district, the superintendent, and ensure that this law is being complied with well again this wasn't a question that we anticipated because we hadn't heard of a case like this before this morning it's certainly something we'll take seriously and go back to the department and uh, have a have a discussion with the leadership team about what a response so you don't know as of right now whether desi who well, let me break this down so desi oversees all the districts correct we have certain responsibilities yes and let's say not even this scenario let's say it's a different scenario um a uh, breach of information, as uh, Representative Meredith indicated. If there's a district that is allowing private information to be leaked out or accessed, does Desi have a responsibility to step in and try to correct those wrongs and to, let's say, penalize the people that were responsible? That section of the law where they have to report uh, data breaches to us does not give us power to uh, take punitive So what you're action. saying today is that these districts can break the law and DESE has no responsibility or oversight over them. That's not universally true. There are sections of the law that do give us corrective powers. So do you, do you need the legislature to act and come back in uh, 20, 2020 uh, to pass some sort of law which would allow DESE to have oversight powers over these districts that are being hurdles in the process of the, the students getting the education that they need? Traditionally, with Missouri being a local control state, DESE has not been given much of that sort of authority would be my answer to that. 
whether or not that's the will of the legislature to give us that authority, I, I leave that up to you guys. So let me, let me move on here a little bit. Um, I, I do want to zero in on, and I know that we are time limited, so I'm going to kind of summarize this up real quick. Uh, the testimony, I believe, in the uh, Cole County case, Dr. Neal, um, I guess it was said in the previous testimony that you had mentioned something about a funding mechanism, the difference between um, the past seven years for summer school with the Grandview districts and offering it in uh, fall and spring. Can you elaborate on that? I were you taken out of context? I did not get the transcript uh, as of yet, but I kind of want to focus on that for the next couple couple minutes. Sure. Um, Twelve fifty is the section of law that uh, shows uh, districts what the requirements are if they wish to claim state aid for virtual instruction. It was very specific up in the first paragraph that that law is about for uh, students that are enrolled in their district for their resident students. Um, interestingly, the law that provides that schools can offer summer school uh, doesn't require that schools offer summer school. And because of that, uh, students can, and, and for good reason, during that summer term, enroll uh, in a district that they are not resident of. So uh, if they're visiting grandparents, something like that, they've they are in a different district, their district doesn't offer summer school, they may enroll elsewhere. And because of the interaction of the enrollment laws and 1250, that means that uh, Grandview is, is uh, able to offer the virtual learning statewide during summer school. And that's fine. When I said it's a, fun, a different part of the law, that's really what I mean. It's about enrollment and funding that's allowed in summer school, but spoken to very specifically in 167. And I, I may contact in you offline. In 167, I may sure, contact sure. you offline to, uh, to get more of that. I know we have a uh, time limit. Uh, let me just go over the rest of my, my notes here. So I know that there was a sunshine law out there in some of my notes that I saw. I believe it was from Senator Onder on um, communications with superintendents and uh, Desi, or I believe might have been just you yourself and superintendents, has that been complied with as of yet? Or I, are you even aware of that? I am aware of it. Uh, our uh, chief counsel probably ought to answer that. Uh, yes, we, um, we have received the Sunshine request and we are discussing the parameters of it because there was no time limitation and some other things that we do for when we do email searches. Is that something that you'd be willing, and I believe Senator Onder would be fine with that being shared uh, with this committee as well, is that something that you can CC us on as the well? So, okay. The request, you mean, or the response? The response. Uh, probably can't CC you. Uh, it might be quite voluminous. Well, and so, that's fine. I think that so this committee like a copy of the response that we provide him. Absolutely. And those, I, I, I know this committee and dealing with the issues with DOR in the past. We are uh, well aware of the, the work that we need to put in to um, to ensure that students are, are getting the, the care uh, and the education that they need. I'm going to turn this over real quick because uh, I know we are time limit. have two more witnesses. Any questions? Representative Deaton, please proceed to inquire. Thank you. Um, so just briefly on the litigation that took place and I want to make sure I understand this you you felt it perhaps wasn't wasn't um, uh, pertinent for you all because you didn't necessarily deny MOVA it was the local school district that was denying the students so you just didn't feel it was really proper for you to be brought into it is that kind of was your rationale is that what I was understanding we never denied <coughs> MOVA to be part of MOCAP because they never applied because so you, s you put out an RFP, right? Correct. But and they started the RFP process, but then they abandoned it. That's irrelevant in my mind. But uh, having seen where this conversation has gone. But prior to the judge's order, you did not have them on the approved Correct. list of providers. Okay. Correct. So that's what I want to focus in on right. because I, I don't understand that due to what the clear language of Senate Bill 603 is. And I just want you to respond to that sentence that's already been quoted previously, but I'll state it again here just for the record. A school district or charter school offering such a course or virtual school program shall be deemed an approved provider. So how did you feel that you were 
had a, had the ability to to essentially circumvent that. I mean, why did you need a judge to come back and tell you what the well they never what the applied. Law said? They never applied under um, subsection fourteen. So the the vehicle wasn't the right vehicle that they used. So let me. So what would an application under subsection fourteen prior to this judge's ruling have looked like in your mind? Well, I believe that the department had taken the position that they needed to go through the RFP process. So it would have included an RFP. Correct. There's a bit of a and part of the reason. Yes, I know, here. and I'm trying not to be. Um, but the reason we were looking at the statute as a whole and looked at all the different responsibilities that DESE has in terms of things that they have to ensure that a provider does. And so we were, at, and I wasn't there, so I'm not sure I can talk you know, directly, but the RFP was the best vehicle to ensure that student data would be secure, that students with, um, with disabilities would have web accessibility and things like that. So, and state monies were being utilized, and so the RFP process. Okay, so the the totality of the law I'm hearing. Correct. Something. We were so looking at the whole statute so instead of just one section so and what trying to marry them together. Which what is other provision of the statute did you feel conflicted with this provision that said shall be an approved provider? What provision seemed contrary to that? I don't want to try to make an exhaustive list, but I would give an example. Subsection 12 uh, indicates that no vendor that is unwilling to accept payments as outlined in Section 3, Subsection 3 would be allowed. So when we looked at the thing, we said it looks like there's a, a pretty strong piece in for including district offered, but there are other requirements as well. And so the totality of the law uh, made us think RFP and do it uniform for everybody. Okay, I won't spend much more time on this, but let me just ask you this. What what was DESE's interpretation? What's your understanding? You know, the legislature, we sat, the, the House, the Senate, we had hearings. This legislation was, was passed and into law signed by the governor. And so it is the law of the state of Missouri that a school district or charter school offering such a course or virtual school program mm -hmm. shall be deemed an approved provider. So what do you take that to mean? prior to the judge's ruling, what did, how did you understand that? We understood that it was a qualified shall be approved, right? You had to meet all the requirements. And that part of the law uh, that you are quoting also says that meets uh, the requirements of 1250. It didn't say who certifies it. Okay. <laughs> we, we were never presented with a here's how we meet 1250. We want to be included because we meet 1250. That was never provided. Well, to it us. seems to me that you could you could necessarily conclude we meant something by it because it seems to me the conclusion you just came to could be said of any provider, an out-state vendor, whether they would need to comply with this and it doesn't really tell us how they how they should come go about doing that. And so clearly we meant something. We we were trying to make some sort of a distinction, unless we're just bipolar, which perhaps you could make a good argument for that. But clearly we were intending something by that that was different than, say, some out-of-state vendor that's not a local school district that doesn't, ha doesn't have a program. Whatever that uh, meaning was, it was something necessarily different. So I'll leave it uh, with that. I have some other questions, but probably um, none that are so pressing. And I'm sure there's other committee members that have questions, too. So considering the time, I'll, uh, I'll yield back. Thank you. Your representative, a half hour left. Representative Meredith. Proceed. Thank you. I, I'm hoping to follow up a little on that. So, first of all, you're essentially saying that it said that they shall be uh, shall be an approved vendor. Doesn't mean shall automatically be an approved vendor. They still have to apply to be an approved vendor, and then they will be approved because they are uh, a vendor at a school district. Is that right? It does say automatically approved. But so it says automatically it does, approved. But we were never presented with a hey, we should be an application to approve. Well, application or something that says hey, we want to offer a program. We'd okay. like to be part of MOCAP. Um, did that same statute from that new law also say that uh, they would be subject to review of all their materials and their courses and all of that um, to make sure that they meet state standards? Correct. It, so once they become an approved provider, then the, the rest of 670 does apply to them. It's which after they make the list of being approved, and that's maybe where we've got the problem here. They should have been approved first. For, for better or worse, our thoughts of we want to try to make sure that this stuff is done up front to get it, to get it done. We obviously 
the judge decided that that didn't need to be done, but we were trying to say, hey, before you're in, let's make sure all these things that are requirements of 161, 670 are complied with. Sure. Um, well, because I, I read the the statute you referenced, uh, 670, 12, subsection 12, um, okay. I heard the accept unwilling to accept payments part, but it's essentially it says no content provider shall be allowed that dot 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 does not meet qu performance or quality standards adopted by the state board of education. And that was the <coughs> reason I believe for the RFP. And and just to follow up, we were trying to do things on the front end so that the courses would be out there all approved, sure. all aligned. And so since the judge's ruling, we reached out that very next day to Grandview, and we received a. Um, the, their customer service information, Good. which had the wrong phone number, oh. but we got that corrected the okay. next day. And then several weeks later, we got a list of teachers who have certif who are certified. We don't know what courses they're teaching because that's all the information you see on our website. That's all we have. And so we've been trying to we've been reaching out to Grandview for over a month. And they're just not giving you the information. No, and that's partly why these school districts that really was the crux of seems like what Mr. Schindler was talking about. But that's the crux of why they're in such a quandary. They don't know whether to approve this because they can't actually make the determination of whether it's in the best interest of a child. The information. And do do you think they have the information? Are they getting it? Oh, the school district. Yeah. I don't. We don't. I don't know. Okay. I know. That I know. Fulton asked for it because they were going to contract separately outside of MoCap with Grandview, and just get rid of the you know settle the lawsuit. But okay. So is where the school district's at now, or Desi rather, where Desi's at now. After the court decision, you automatically add them to the approved vendor list, and which uh, sounds that's like that's consistent far. with the law, and that's what they're saying you should have done all along. But then you're saying, and we need information so that we can vet you after the fact in order for a school district to determine whether it's in the best interest of a child to utilize you? Well, I'll, well not necessarily, but to make sure that we are complying with six With the other pieces of the law. Right, which, which require us to do reporting to you. Well, if we don't have any courses, we can't report anything. Supposedly these um, 300 kids are, are enrolled in classes. We have no idea. We don't know what classes they're taking. We don't know what age, what grade levels they're offering. We, we don't have any information. Interesting. Okay, now are, have any other vendors at all um, attempted to, to be an approved vendor uh, and offer their courses without submitting an RFP? Yes. Okay. Launch out of Springfield came in within, what was it? Last Launch? Week? Launch? Same day, launch out of Springfield. Okay, and it's powered by launch. This was I'm sorry. Springfield's virtual program is it's called launch. They came in the same day that this court decision came down. As the court decision, so they waited for the court decision and then correct. Then they said add us to your we, list. We let them in, and if you look on our chart, they've supplied you know many more. Their courses are all out there. There's a lot more information they've provided to us. Okay, have you gotten the course information from? Okay, but you've gotten it from launch. Yes. So did launch. They didn't go through the RFP process, but they gave you all of the information that would have been required in the RFP process, essentially. They've been up and running for, this would know more. The answer is yes, they gave us the information. Okay, so essentially, without being the official process, they're, you're, you're, they're making sure you can vet them the same way that you're required to under the law. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Follow up from Representative Deaton. So I'll ask my lesser questions here since we do seem to have the time. So what, and I, I think this was this was talked about earlier, but I just want to be absolutely clear. What guidance has has DESE given to school districts relating to anything we've spoken about today? Has there been any guidance given? We have issued a number of uh, administrative memos uh, about what they are and aren't supposed to do in terms of uh, things like their uh, adoption of policy and their enrollment process and things like that, where to find the most up-to-date information on our course catalog and things like that. And that's that's not like 10 years ago, that's more recent. Those are these memos. Yes. That, okay, can you provide those to the, this committee? Would that be Absolutely. possible? Okay, appreciate that. And then how many students, and Perhaps you don't know the answer to this question, and I honestly don't know if you do or not, but I, I ask it in, uh, in good faith. How many students have been approved and, and denied? Is that information that DESE, Desi has? 
the approval and denial information uh, re related to MOVA was new to us today. Uh, we are aware that some of our vendors have given early reports about course enrollment, so it's not the number of students, but student classes. One student could take more than one class, but we don't have a complete list of that either. Okay, is that something, and again, I don't genuinely know the, what the answer to this question is going to be, but is that something you anticipate you'll have in the future, be able to supply with, okay, both on the approval and the denials, or is that, I mean, being held with the local school district, I'm not sure if that's information you'd have well, or not. School districts are not required to report to us, like, we approved 10 kids, but we denied five kids. We would know they denied five if it came to the level of an appeal to us, but that's how, that's the only way we would. But know. otherwise, we, we, we just know, we, we will be able to see yeah. Jeff City has 12 students enrolled taking 20 courses. So if I wanted to determine how many students had been denied in the state of Missouri, I'd likely have to go to every school district and supply a sunshine law request of how many students have been denied, something that you'd have to go to each district to find that information out, I guess, is correct. Probably. Okay. I was just was curious as to that. All right. Those are... No further questions. Thank you, Representative. Um, I guess in closing, uh, again, thank you all for coming here uh, today. I'm hoping that this will be the last hearing that we have on this. Uh, I'm encouraging DESE uh, to work with the school districts, provide some guidance. Uh, again, ultimately what we want is to ensure that these students, whether uh, advanced, whether they have medical issues, whether they are, are problematic in a traditional setting, or receiving the education that they need. Um, so I'm encouraging you, and I know that there is some sort of discussion later uh, this afternoon. Uh, so I, I applaud all of the actors in, in taking part in that. So hopefully you all can get together uh, and, and ensure how to strictly comply with this law uh, because ultimately we'll have, we'll have two, two things happening here. Uh, the rest of 2019, 2020, I'll never hear from this committee again. Uh, or kind of like with DOR, you'll be here the rest of 2019, 2020, providing hordes of documents for us to review. Um, so with that being said, I will uh, again thank you for your testimony, and I believe we have another witness, Darby O'Donnell, uh, to please come forward, fill out a witness form, and start when you're ready. We have 20 minutes left. on there we go uh, members of the committee thank you for attending and staying for the day I appreciate that my name is Darby O'Donnell and I am appearing on behalf of the National Coalition for Public School Options PSO uh, for which I am the manager of the uh, Missouri chapter I am from Kansas City um, PSO uh, Josh Schindler referenced it because he is our attorney is a national alliance of parents in active in over 30 states that supports and defends the parents' right to access the best public options for their children. PSO advocates for free and equal access without restrictions to these public schools for all children. I appear today on behalf of parents in Missouri who have sounded the call for more options in public education. And last year with the passage of the state's new virtual education law, MOCAP legislation, parents met with your fellow lawmakers uh, and peered at hearings so that you and your colleagues would strongly consider the opportunity to give parents a full menu of school choice options, including a full-time <laughs> virtual education. Um, this body, including Senator Onder and uh, Representative Phil Cristofanelli, thank you, Senator Onder, for being here today, should be applauded for passage of the law that replaced MoVIP with MoCap. PSO heard from parents for many years ones that move from across state lines, from Oklahoma or Kansas to Missouri, or who were looking for a different option, we heard that virtual courses and a full-time online experience were desperately needed, particularly since most of uh, Missouri's border states already had the option, and as we've discussed today, Missouri just wasn't competitive. The legislation passed in 2018, as you heard from Josh Schindler, and I'll just reiterate, was very clear. Courses offered that met the statutory standard would automatically be approved by DESE for MOCAP. In addition, resident school districts or DESE would have a limited ability to deny or revoke the approval of a course when a parent has determined that the course was best for their child. 
This legislative action was a welcome development for those who had fought for over a decade to see its passage and who had long considered a full-time virtual option to be the best educational option for their child. Has, however, as you have heard today and as I will describe in further detail, DESE has been undermining the parents' right to choose by undermining the letter of the law and has had resident school districts by its side putting parents and students in limbo even now the 2019 and 2020 school year has commenced. Legal action to right side some of their, uh, has, was needed to right side some of their recent actions as you've heard. Parents are the number one stakeholder in any education decision. I regret that the parents we work with daily could not be here today. They are virtual school learning coaches and work full time or are full time caregivers to their medically challenged children who are desperate for a virtual option. I know these families and I know these kids. They come from all walks of life, all corners of the Show Me State, and run the gamut of elementary and secondary school ages. However, PSO knows directly from Missouri parents, those currently enrolled and those unable to enroll in a full-time virtual option, that parents are not being placed at the forefront of critical education decisions. Desi, multiple district superintendents and other high-ranking school officials are misinforming parents whether intentionally or not about the virtual school option the process of enrollment as you've heard and the district's role in assessing courses this culture of misinformation perpetuated by government officials is hindering the implementation of the law you passed last year and more significantly harming the educational aspirations of Missouri students to illustrate what I mean, I would like to provide a couple more examples to um, piggyback what Josh Schindler offered in terms of clerical error and process, in terms of um, forms being approved and then denied. We are hearing that. That would be number one, what we probably hear. Um, parents are not responsible to research every person they come into contact or after four or five calls of dealing with administrators are directed to interact with when getting an approved form signed. Um, Another one we hear is um, refusal to sign an approved form because the district has another preferred online provider. And this practice undermines the law, as was just spoken about a few minutes ago, because while the home district may provide their own virtual courses, that's perfectly fine. Um, the decision rests with parents um, which program serves their student the best. They cannot be forced into a program. Three, lack of transparency, administrative hoops. You've heard a little bit of this, but basically playing games with parents about whether they need to be there in person, um, whether they need to send or mail in or can mail in the district approval form or it can be submitted electronically. Parents have heard all kinds of excuses that only serve to waste the parents' time and hinder the delivery of education. Um, another one, Josh, I think has gone into great detail of is the lack of clarity and decision making at the district level. I think you all have heard that one uh, and we can skip that. Um, and then five, stating that certain approved programs are not on the DESE website, are not approved by DESE, their teachers are not accredited. Um, this is certainly not an exhaustive list but provides a flavor for the manner in which districts are skirting the law in the name of uh, misinformation instead of providing adequate resources to parents. Um, I'm going to skip this just to, for the sake of time, but suffice it to say, if you are a parent, the districts in DESE are hoping your family gets frustrated and discouraged to the point that they re-enroll in the home district and forget about virtual because then the district does not have to pay another district for the student's education. PSO believes these games fly in the face of the intent of the law you passed by undermining a parent's right to choose in the virtual option now available in the state of Missouri. Um, Josh Schindler referenced this earlier, but um, parents are, there are intimidation tactics being used. Parents are being told that superintend by superintendents that lawyers will get, district lawyers will get involved. Um, I, for example, I work with one parent in the western side of the state who went into a meeting last week. This is a college educated single mother that was called into a meeting with high level district leaders, according to her where the leaders with doctorate degree degrees all tried to persuade her to go to a different program for her high schooler. Um, that has been a fairly typical process. Um, parents go into these meetings and um, get intimidated. And that's why we've had to um, adjudicate. 
parents have had to engage counsel, and PSO has spent the summer with parents seeking equitable enrollment for their children at no cost to the parents. PSO has supported and counseled families through successful resolutions in and out of the courtroom, thanks to the attorneys at the Schindler Law Firm and the willingness of PSO-affiliated parents to share their stories and speak up. Uh, I will not detail those cases, as Josh Schindler, I believe, has covered those. Suffice it to say, legal action has provided relief to Missouri parents. Um, not far from here, we had Judge Wood make a critical decision um, in Cole County that quickly and summarily exposed Desi's utter disregard for the new law. PSO welcomes additional guardrails and oversight to curtail the bad practices at the department and district level. PSO appreciates your leadership in this manner. The good news is that an innovative school choice models are coming to Missouri with passage of the virtual school legislation. They are here. Virtual schools provide a statewide program for students to enroll regardless of zip code or geographic locations. Parents need to be empowered to make decisions about the virtual school option without limits or second guessing by administrative or bureaucratic approvals. Thank you for your time and attention today and I'm happy to answer any of your questions about my testimony. Thank you, Ms. O'Donnell. Uh, I know you asked for uh, oversight and thankfully uh, we have a committee called Government Oversight and here you are. Uh, I, I will state on behalf of the chair who is in a, another hearing that if any of these parents feel as though they are being intimidated uh, or harassed in their decision, feel free to give them our information in this committee and we will um, conduct more hearings as necessary. But with only 10 minutes left, uh, are there any questions for this witness? Seeing none, fill out a witness form and thank you for coming today. Last, the last witness I believe we have is a uh, Mr. Brown. Could you please come forward and you are limited to a lengthy 10 minutes. My name is Mike Brown. I work for a company called Show Me State Virtual LLC. I promote Grandview's uh, summer school program, have done so for the last few years. I am the retired superintendent of Grandview. I started the program. The program was designed originally to help Grandview kids get outside help because we couldn't offer courses. We didn't have the teachers and all. We wanted to offer things such as Mandarin, Chinese, Latin, so forth for our kids. We also wanted to give our kids exposure to virtual education so when they went to college and took those virtual courses they were required to take as freshmen and sophomores, they would be prepared. That's how we started it. What happened was we immediately started getting requests from other school districts to allow kids to come to our summer program. We had parents from all over the state calling us and asking us to let them come. So we saw a way to have a, uh, expand our virtual summer school program, to employ more of our teachers, and to help kids around the state. Now we've probably educated close to 10,000 kids in their summer school program. We have currently we had 2,000 last summer enroll in the courses. Right now in the uh, year-round program, the latest numbers I have is that 700 kids are in the pipeline and over 200 have completed the process. What the Grandview program does is allows any student anywhere in the state in the summertime to take a course, to get educated in a course that they may not get anywhere else. What we're attempting to do with the year-round program is to offer courses that they can't get other places or they can't get it in their home school district for the various reasons you've heard mentioned. Our program is unique. It's a little different from every other program. All the programs have some sources or some things that are good for them. But our program offers certified technical education courses, Latin, Mandarin Chinese. We have all those courses. Now, the State Department, DESE people did mention that we have not provided the course uh, outlines and guides for them. My understanding is that is in the pipeline and will be delivered to them within the next week or so. Uh, again, I do not speak for Grandview School District. I'm telling you that is my understanding. The, th the problem 
we've had so far is is I think is a power in the control situation. I think there needs to become a better understanding between the school districts, DESE, everybody, in what we want to accomplish with this virtual education legislation that the, the legislature passed. What is good for a kid? Not what's good for me as superintendent, not what's good for DESE, but what's good for a kid? That's what it's all about. And right now, we're not doing that. And we need to get to the point where we can do that. I can assure you, and I can speak for Grandview in this instance, Grandview will work with DESE to make this, this work. We will provide the information that the law requires us to provide, and we will also try to be cooperative. Now, there's been some conflicts, there's been some questions uh, where we were required to do it. The, the RFP was started, they were told not they didn't have to do it. Then again, they were told they did have to do it. So now the RFP process just now came online, so there was no way to do it up until last week, as I might understand. I don't know. What I do know is Grandview has a good program. Technologically, it is sound, safe, and that's not ever been a question with Desi. We have qualified, certified teachers. If you don't have qualified, certified teachers teaching class, you don't get paid for it. So I don't think Desi's questioning any of those things. I think what needs to be done is that Desi, the school districts, and the law need to be virtually met and worked out. That's my comments, and I'll take any questions you've got. Well, thank you, Mr. Brown, um, not only for coming here today, but playing a, a vital hand in creating this program in our state. Um, I, I know several in my district and in St. Charles County alike uh, that have benefited from uh, these programs, and, and I look forward to you helping kind of bring all the parties together to ensure every student in Missouri gets the education they need. Uh, I've got one simple question, and, uh, again, I haven't found this info out. Um, with with your program being in existence for, I think, the past seven years, you were 1250 compliant the entire time, correct? My knowledge, we met every requirement Desi set before us. In fact, I was told when I was superintendent by then uh, Assistant Commissioner Fuse, I believe was his name, that we were in compliant. And, in, and I have no knowledge of any time that we were never in compliant. Wait a minute, that's not true. One summer, I offered a course with a teacher and we thought the teacher was certified. When Desi notified us when the teacher was not certified, we didn't get paid for that, and we still worked it out. But other than that. So being 1250 compliant for seven years, I think that that would be sufficient evidence. Yeah. Yes, sir. Moving forward that your program is compliant for, for this law in the virtual school program. To my knowledge, Grandview is in compliance with the law. Okay. For, for timing purposes, I'm going to open it up. Any questions for this witness? One from Representative Meredith. Thanks, Mr. Clark. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your work in education and trying to improve options and opportunities. Uh, sounds like good work. I, I, just so I understand the structure, you're, uh, you were the superintendent or are the superintendent? No, sir. I was the superintendent who started this program seven years ago. I seven years retired. ago, you were superintendent of Grandview. Yes, and then you, did you leave to start this program? or did? No, sir. I started the program when I was superintendent. Gotcha. Okay, now is this a... I'm, I'm a little confused about this program. Is it a private company or is it the school district? The school district runs the virtual program. We use some of our courses and we buy courses from a company called Fuel Ed, Fuel which, Ed. which is a part of K-12. We have done that. K-12 Inc. Yeah. is the name of the company. The same company, Fuel Ed, who, who is a part of K-12, okay. was also MOPIP certified, and that's how we originally found them. They were on the DESE website as an accepted provider to the state of Missouri. So we purchased their courses in our summer program. Okay, so K-12 is based out of where? Do you Virginia, know? I think. Virginia, they're a for-profit company in Virginia yes, offering sir. online courses. As far as I know. I'm just trying to make sure I understand all of how this works. And then you all at Grandview um, incorporated some of their courses into your program. That's correct. And so now students at other school districts around the state want to be able to access K-12 through your school district. That's correct. That's in the summer through the summer program. Yes. Just summer or just summer. I, all I've dealt with so up until right now. Okay, because I thought the earlier testimony was that the summer was being treated by Desi as 
okay, but different that, that's than the, the, the point that I can speak to, sir, okay. is the summer program, which we have run in the past. We have just now getting ready to start the fall and winter year-round program. We have not offered it yet because it has just now come online through DESE. Gotcha. Okay, has has K-12, to your knowledge, had any data breach problems in I have no months? idea, sir. Okay. I'm not qualified to speak for K-12. Okay, fair enough. I appreciate that. Thank you. I am qualified to say that Grandview didn't have, didn't have any virtual. Again, thank you all for uh, coming today. Hopefully, this is the one and only time we meet. Uh, however, please be advised as if this uh, issue persists, we will be back in the next couple of months. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.